Okay, hello everyone. Good morning for those that are in uh, Europe and good afternoon for the friends that are following us from uh, from Japan. It's uh, 4.59 p.m. here in Tokyo and today we are here for the Tech Transfer webinar number 27, Patent Enforcement in Japan, How to Efficiently Utilize Your Patent Rights. Before introducing the, the speakers that, by the way, today are uh, with me, we are in the same room here uh, at their offices, I would like to maybe spend one minute to talk about the, the help desk as usual, introduce myself. My name is Lucas Kofi, as you can see from the slide here, I'm the project manager of the, of the help desk. And uh, here you can find my email, the uh, references to the website, the ongoing uh, survey that we are running for the uh, SMEs in Europe. So if you know anyone, uh, and in Japan as well, so if you know anyone that is uh, working or owning uh, an SME, please do share the, the link. It would be nice to have more people involved in this survey. And also, uh, we have the last link, that is the uh, link to register to the, uh, to the newsletter. Without further ado, uh, I would like to tell you that today I'm at Shiga International Patent Office, which is one of the largest firms in Japan, specializing in intellectual property with around 730 people working for, for them. Uh, they represent domestic and international clients from startups companies to Fortune 500 in filing applications at, in front of the Japanese Patent Office. Today, uh, specifically, I'm with uh, Dr. Hashimoto, that uh, specializes in general machinery, fluid machinery, heat exchangers, optical fibers, and control systems. He has an extensive experience in incoming and outgoming uh, patent filings and prosecution. Dr. Hashimoto regularly lectures on a wide range of IP topics at foreign IP organizations such as BPLA, ACCJ, and IPLEC. Then we have Mr. Mori. Mr. Mori specializes in material sciences and uh, particular in organic chemistry. He's handling patent prosecutions related to chemical compounds and electronic devices such as solar batteries on behalf of overseas applicants. Uh, without further ado, I would like to give the floor. Hello, everyone. All right. Sorry. <laughs> uh, thank you, Luca, for uh, introducing me. I'm uh, Satoru of Shiga uh, International Patent Office. And also, thank you everyone for attending today's webinar. Uh, this presentation material includes four topics. I'm going to explain the first topic, and then Dr. Hashimoto is going to explain the rest of the topics. So let me start explaining overview of enforcement procedures. I try to focus on the practice that is unique to Japan because the time is limited. If you come up with any questions, please give us after the presentation. All right, uh, let's suppose that you are a patent holder of a Japanese patent and you find a product by a third party that seems to infringe your patent right. What should you do if you want the third party to stop producing or selling the product? Usually, going to the court is a final option. You may have to go to the court to file a lawsuit at the end of the day, but before doing that, steps one to three should be considered. The first step is to determine if the patent infringement really occurs. If you want to enforce your patent right, you are responsible for proving that there actually exists an infringement. The second step is to prepare and send a letter of warning to the potential infringer. The warning may be an oral warning, for example, by telephone or by face-to-face. However, the warning is usually done by sending a written warning letter because infringement of a patent, patent right 
tends to be complex and because misunderstanding should be avoided. The third step is a negotiation with the potential infringer. Potential infringer sometimes asks for a settlement after they receive a warning letter from a patent holder. If the negotiation comes to rupture, the only way to enforce your patent right is to go to a court and file an infringement lawsuit. In the following slides, I'm going to explain each of the four steps. The first step is to determine if the patent infringement really occurs. In general, the first step can be divided into three parts. First, you have to check the scope of protection. Please be sure to refer to the claims granted by the JPO, not by other patent offices. Then, uh, you should identify the products or methods in concern. Here, it is not sufficient to merely specify the product names or model numbers. You have to identify the specific embodiment of the pro uh, products or methods in concern, such that the specific embodiment can be compared to the patented invention. After the product or method is identified, you should analyze them to know if your patent right covers the product or the method. These procedures would not be much different in any countries. However, there are a few unique laws in Japan, so I'd like to introduce, introduce them to you today. This slide and the next slide show the text of Article 65 of Japanese Patent Act. This article is directed to an act by a third party after the patent application is published by the JPO and before the patent is registered. In short, an applicant of a patent application can claim for compensation against a potential infringer if the patent application has been published and then the applicant has warned the potential infringer. Even if the patent, uh, if, even if the applicant does not issue the warning letter, the applicant can claim for compensation if the potential infringer knows that his or her product is within the scope of the claims of the published patent application. Of course, as specified in paragraph 2, the patent must be registered in order to claim for compensation in order to actually claim for compensation. However, this article is unique and useful because you can enforce your patent right against the act before the patent is registered. And uh, this slide shows the text of Article 104-3, and this article is directed to patent invalidity defense during uh, litigation proceedings. Before this law was introduced in 2004, if the accused party believes that the patent includes reasons for re invalidation, the accused party needed to actually invalidate the patent through an invalidation trial in order to prevent the enforcement of the subject patent. However, under the current Japanese patent law, the accused party can argue in the court that uh, patent right cannot be enforced because the patent should be invalidated. So the accused party does not have to file a request for invalidation trial to prevent the enforcement of the subject patent. On the other hand, from the standpoint of a patent holder, you should check that the patent in concern does not have a reason for invalidation before you enforce your patent right. Um, 
This slide shows the text of article 104-2, and this article is was introduced to make it easier for the patent owner to demonstrate that uh, there exists an infringement. This article states that in a litigation procedure, the accused party must clarify its specific embodiment if the accused party denies the uh, specific embodiment, identify the patent holder. For example, uh, let's suppose that the patent holder argues that the accused party performs a method consisting of steps A, B, and C. And the accused party wants to deny the argument by the patent holder. The accused party must clarify what kind of steps the accused party is using. For example, they must disclose that they are using a method consisting of steps A, B, and D, not A, B, and C. This article helps that uh, helps the patent holder verify an infringement. However, it is not allowed for the patent holder to just say, hey, there is an infringement. It's not allowed. The patent holder is obliged to identify the specific embodiment of the product or method in concern such that the specific embodiment can be compared to the patented invention. And this slide shows the doctrine of equivalence. Even if the product or method in concern is not within the literal scope of the patent, an infringement under the doctrine of equivalence exists if all, the, all of the five, uh, following five requirements are satisfied. Uh, today, I don't go into detail because the time is limited, but uh, pro practically, I would say that chances of winning an infringement under the doctrine of equivalence is not high in Japan. Right. Uh, after you confirm that there is an infringement, as a second step, you prepare a warning letter and send it to the potential infringer. The purpose of the letter is to notify the uh, potential infringer of an infringement. So the letter should explain in detail why the patent holder thinks that there is an infringement. In addition, you should avoid emotional messages or a threat in the warning letter. The, letter uh, the warning letter should be sent to the potential infringer, but should not sent to the clients of the potential infringer, because there would be a risk to violate Unfair Competition Prevention Act. After you send the warning letter, the potential infringer may want to negotiate with you. This will be further discussed by Dr. Hashimoto later. Um, if the negotiation comes to rupture, the only way to enforce the patent right is going to the court. The lawsuit of a uh, patent infringement case should be submitted to either Tokyo District Court or Osaka District Court. This circular chart shows the statistics of patent litigation cases in, in the district courts between 2014 and 2016. This data was provided by the IP High Court. If you go for a settlement, in most cases, you, uh, you can get at least either monetary relief or injunctive relief. On the other hand, if the case goes to a court decision, the chance of winning is only around 25%. So if the accused party suggests a way of settlement, we recommend you to consider the settlement. If you go for the settlement, you may have to make some concessions and you may not be able to get what uh, get everything what you want 
However, you can save the time, the money, and the energy for continuing the litigation proceedings. So the settlement is usually a beneficial option for the patent owner. And this slide shows that the number of litigation cases in Japan is much lower than the number of the, uh, num the number in the United States. And as a side note, the average pending period at the district court is around 15 months, and the average pending period at the IP High Court is around eight months. All right, this is all for the first topic, and uh, Dr. Hashimoto takes over from the next slide. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Mori, and once again, um, hello, my name is Hiroyuki Hashimoto of Shiga International Patent Office in Japan, and thanks again for all of you to join the, today's webinar. Um, in the rest of the um, webinar, let me, I would like to make some explanation about uh, possible pro options, uh, what you can take in uh, enforcement of your patent right. In uh, section two, I'd like to explain about effective measure of your patent right, namely preliminary injunction. As the, uh, Dr. Mori mentioned that uh, patent lawsuit is the final option to enforce your patent right, but the problem is that uh, of the patent infringement losses is that it takes longer time to, uh, to reach to the final conclusion. It means the final uh, infringement losses proceed takes longer time to the judgment compared with general civil actions. The terms to a judgment is for general civil action eight to nine months. But uh, patent infringement lawsuit takes 18 months. However, sometimes patent right must be protected much faster. So, uh, in order to um, make a fast uh, enforcement or fast realize a fast protection, preliminary injunction, injunction could be one option to realize first protection of patent right. This was explain the difference between preliminary injunctions and infringement lawsuit. The trial period for a preliminary injunction is a little bit shorter than the actual trial. It means for the general normal infringement lawsuit, it takes more than one year, like one year or one and a half year. But for preliminary injunction, you can obtain a result less than a year, about 10 months or so. But the important point of the preliminary injunction is that in preliminary injunction, damages cannot be claimed. So only you can do is to ask the injunction, but you cannot ask the compensation of the damage. And in preliminary injunction, if you win at the first trial, you can enforce the judgment immediately. And this is totally different from the infringement lawsuit because in the infringement lawsuit, unless the judgment is finalized, it cannot be enforced. So in the infringement lawsuit, if the other party fights it, it means that if the other party files the appeal to the judgment, the judgment cannot be enforceable until the, the Supreme Court has ruled the case. So in, compared to the infringement lawsuit, you can realize the first protection of the patent right by means of preliminary injunction. And in the case of preliminary injunctions, if there is a petition from the infringer side, 
The patent owner must file an infringement action along with it. And in preliminary injunctions, witness interrogation cannot be performed. And in preliminary injunction, it is easy to keep what matters will raise a secret. And in the preliminary injunctions, the doctrine of equivalent cannot be claimed. So the preliminary injunction is uh, useful uh, if you want to keep a case secret and if you want to uh, realize the fast protection of your patent right. And in the case of preliminary injunction, in order to put pressure on the defendant after an infringement disclosure in the plaintiff's favor, it's, it's advantageous. So filing a preliminary injunction for the purpose of an advantageous settlement is also one option. And since the trial period is little less than a year, so if you received, uh, uh, if you become a defendant, if you received a preliminary injunction, it is not necessary to be panicked. So you can take the same action as you do an infringement suit. Explain to the court that it does not infringe the patent right. Also, assert that the patent is invalid. And this right is uh, explaining if you receive the preliminary injunction. So, on the other side, the, when you file the preliminary injunction, the procedure takes less than a year. So, it's, the procedure goes very fast, faster than the uh, uh, normal lawsuit. So, the time management is important for the preliminary injunction. And this slide uh, explaining the, the case, uh, comparing a uh, comparison between the infringement lawsuit and the preliminary injunction. And consider whether this, uh, there is a patent that can be used to attack the other party. And Japanese companies are more likely to reconcile when they are counterattacked. From day to day, you should apply the patent that Japanese company dislike. And consider whether to file an invalidation trial. However, in recent years, the proportion of patents, the patent office judges, has invalid is about 20%. So invalidation rate in Japan is not so high recently. So filing an invalidation trial could be one option, but it's not totally um, uh, effective in uh, recent years. So here is a brief explanation of the preliminary injunction. And in next section, I'd like to make an um, explanation about arbitration or mediation process. And as uh, Dr. Mori mentioned that in Japan, the infringement lawsuit is the final option, but the settlement between party would, would be the first option when they, you want to enforce the patent right. But Sometimes the settlement negotiation will not go smooth all the time, and sometimes the negotiation will not make um, infringements. Then in that case, the arbitration or mediation process would be of some help to conduct a smooth negotiation between the parties. And here is the overview of arbitration or mediation process. As an alternative to litigation, the parties may agree to settle their dispute through alternative dispute resolution, namely ADR, such as mediation or arbitration, can be used. 
ADR makes it more effective in terms of promptly settling dispute over a large number of domestic and international patents. And ADR may be a more prompt and more cost-effective approach compared to a lawsuit, unless it is used to delay negotiations or increase costs. And parties have more flexibility in settling their own rules and procedures the arbitrators can set royalties for both parties. And in Japan, ADR includes the following two types. First one is adjustment type, and second one is determination type. And adjustment type ADR includes mediation and conciliation. And determination type ADR includes arbitration and determination. As you can see from this slide, there are four types of procedures in Japan, uh, ADR in Japan. And uh, in the following slide, the difference between four procedures will be uh, schematically uh, explained. First one is mediation. Mediation is a procedure which promotes resolution dispute, which quickly by encourage party to comply, uh, compliance with each other. And mediation is a procedure proceeds under the agreement of both parties. Thus, there is no compuls, uh, compulsion. An important point is that in mediation process, the mediator is included in the negotiation, but mediator themselves or himself or herself do not make any decision or do not make any conclusion. So mediation process is that uh, mediator promote or facilitate the negotiation, negotiation in both parties. So the negotiation must be done by both parties and mediator just facilitate or just watch the procedure of the negotiation. So mediators in uh, mediation procedure, mediator does not have a um, significant impact on the negotiation itself. But in conciliation, the conciliator is involved in the negotiation. And the difference of the conciliation from the mediation is that in the conciliation, the conciliator actively intervenes between the parties and leads the initiative on the substantive counters, uh, contents of dispute resolution. So the conciliation is kind of system of public authority. In the conciliation, the conciliator makes some proposal how to make agreement in both parties. And in the end of the consideration, both parties will make a decision if they agree to the proposal of the conciliator or not. So in the conciliation, conciliator has some effect to settle the specific uh, conclusion or agreement in both parties. So in the conciliation procedure, conciliator has much more uh, impact compared with the mediation procedure. And the third one is arbitration. The arbitration is the procedure that arbitrator is involved in negotiation. In the case that both parties agree to use arbitration proceedings, the decision made by the arbitrator has the same legal effect as a final judgment. And it means in arbitration, arbitrator make decision and uh, uh, parties, uh, parties involved in the negotiation must follow the uh, results made by the arbitrator. So in the arbitration procedure, power of arbitrator is much more larger, much more significant compared with the mediation or conciliation. And the last one is determination. A determination is set up for the case when it is difficult to resolve by an agreement like 
mediation, conservation, and arbitration. So in the uh, arbitration or mediation process, the determination procedure is um, a final option. Uh, it's not involved in the uh, general procedure. So it's like um, uh, exceptional. So when the uh, settlement or negotiation is not go well, the final option is to take determination. This slide explaining the advantages of ADR. First one is non disclosivity and second one is flexibility, and third one is expertise, fourth one is promptness, and last one, internationality. And an ADR procedure adopts in camera procedures, so the process of the negotiation is not disclosed in ADR. So non-disclosivity is one advantage of the ADR. And since ADR's procedure has high flexibility at conciliator after its discretion, the ADR procedure is so flexible. And in ADR, technical ex experts could be nominated as conciliator or arbitrator, so expertise is one of the advantages of ADR. And judiciary proceedings take more than a few years, but ADO takes can be uh, settled much more faster. So the promptness is one of the big advantage. And this slide shows the disadvantages of ADO. Some consider, however, that there are disadvantages to the use of ADO. For example, ADO requires prior agreement between the disputing parties, which means that these agreements over procedures can become protracted, and it is difficult to determine the validity of patent rights through ADO. And the content of ADO is undisclosed and thus and lacking transparency. So these are the can consider as the disadvantages of ADO. And here is the last part of the presentation. It's the discussion through all the contents. And the first point is that well, how does the arbitration or mediation process will actually, up, actually work? And possible reason why number of litigation in Japan is so low is that first reason might be the litigation it takes high cost, and second one is amount of damage compensation is not sufficient. And high likelihood to lost lawsuit, and first one is not fully enforceable in litigation. Um, as uh, Dr. Mori explained that in Japan, we have a system of restriction of exercise of rights by the patentee, Article 104-3 of Japan Patent Act. And last, but I think it's most important, is that uh, because of Japanese national characteristics, parties and interests tend to avoid dispute in court. So ADR has high affinity for interested Japanese parties, let's say the companies. Here is the, uh, a type of ADR uh, which are available in Japan. There is a wide variety of arbitration or mediation authorities. First one is civilian type ADR. Second one is justice type ADR. And third one is administrative type ADR. The first one includes several authorities like JIPSC or JCAA. And second one, justice type ADR is 
uh, established and administered by the court. And consideration of civil affairs, family consideration, etc., is included in the justice type ADR. And the last one, uh, in administrative type ADR, the ADR established by administrative agents were developed in Japan. And for specific fields and a spe uh, special law, arrangement for mediation, conciliation, and arbitration are set up to resolve dispute. And here is the tips uh, from outside. Uh, how to utilize your patent right in Japan, uh, taking the whole contents of the today's uh, webinar. Uh, first point is that negotiation for settlement would be the first choice when you consider enforcing patent right. It means uh, when you find a potential infringer, you should send a letter of caution at first. But next step, would be conducting the negotiation for settlement, and it is not recommended to bring it to the court immediately. So the first option should be make a, a negotiation for settlement. And if the negotiation does not go smooth, one option is to utilize ADR. And as I mentioned in, uh, in my presentation, ADR can be used to facilitate the negotiation, and there are several options for ADR. And when you go to the um, lawsuit, it means if you want to bring a case to the uh, court, the preliminary injunction can be utilized for conducting, also for negotiation, because the preliminary injunction uh, is um, fast proceedings and quick enforcement. And uh, maybe you have a, a question, uh, which would be better to use, ADR or preliminary inj injunction? And one important point is that uh, it is mentioned in a slide, in a preliminary injunction, it is uh, questionable if the doctrine of equivalent can be adopted or not. So if it is not clear and, uh, if the infringer's product is included in your technical scope or not, then if you have some doubt if the infringe, uh, patent infringement occurs or not, ADR should be better to use because ADR is much more flexible and fast procedure compared with the uh, uh, court action on um, patent infringement lawsuit. But in case, if it is clear that uh, potential infringer's product is clearly included in the scope of your patent, the combination between preliminary injunction and negotiation for settlement would be much more uh, effective to enforce the patent right because you can obtain uh, results very fast from the preliminary injunction and when you get uh, uh, results from the preliminary injunction from the court you can put up uh, uh, some uh, pressure to the infringe, uh, potential infringer and it bring, uh, it become possible for you to conduct a negotiation settlement advantageous for you. And this is uh, some tips from outside to uh, how to utilize the patent right in Japan effectively. And thank you all. And this is all of my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you for your questions. and. Uh... I'm Satoru, and I'm going to answer to the first question, uh, which is uh, how about filing a lawsuit without uh, issuing a, a warning letter? Uh, it's not mandatory to issue a warning letter to a potential infringer, so uh, it's possible to do that. 
but uh, in Japan, most of the cases we uh, send a warning letter to a potential infringer first. So it gives an aggressive impression, uh, aggressive impression to the potential infringer, and it is possible that uh, negotiation becomes a little bit difficult, or it may, it may be difficult to reach a good settlement in a good manner. So uh, in order to make it easier, make the negotiation easier, uh, we uh, usually recommend uh, file, uh, issuing a warning letter first. Hi then, um, I'm Hashimoto, and let me answer to the second question, the level of code. What's the second question? And uh, actually, the Tokyo District Court and Osaka District Court is on the same level, and IP High Court is on uh, one, uh, one level higher. The IP High Court is the uh, High Court. Uh, existing between uh, uh, district court and uh, supreme court. So let's say IP high court is one level higher than the Tokyo and Osaka district court. And third one would be if lawsuit is not very effective, why would an influence be an influence be? And uh, actually, um, maybe this, um, I, we have made uh, too much stress on the effectiveness of the lawsuit. And actually, we are not in the opinion that lawsuit if itself is not effective. But uh, what we want to say is that the Japanese parties like company does not want to dispute in court and they prefer to make a settlement outside of the litigation. So this is this might come from uh, Japanese culture and, uh, and and from this uh, background, uh, this um, the lawsuit is not uh, the, is not the first choice in Japan. So the um, negotiation or ADR uh, is um, more uh, high affinity to the Japanese company. This is what we want to um, tell you uh, through this uh, um, webinar. And maybe we have one more. Uh, thank you very much for first question. We have received the question uh, difference between uh, arbitration and uh, determination. And actually, from the point of view of ADR, determination is exceptional because the determination must use other uh, um, uh, this uh, determination must be made based on other laws or acts like the Japan Patent Act or not, or something else. But uh, arbitration can be made in both parties without any uh, specific ground of uh, laws or articles. So the arbitration uh, is much more easier to get to the uh, results. But in compared to the arbitration, determination needs another uh, grounds for make settlement. So from this point of view, arbitration is much more easier than the determination.
Yeah, thank you for your um, question. What measures can be ordered in a preliminary injunction, and is there any deadline for requesting it? And um, to ask the preliminary injunction, uh, the procedure itself is similar to a normal um, uh, court action, normal infringement lawsuit, but you need additional reason why you ask the preliminary injunction and you have to submit the specific reason why the preliminary injunction is necessary and this um, reason might be the necessity of uh, uh, secure the, some evidence or some assets and you have to secure before the uh, actual court action starts, then you have to explain the judge why it is necessary to make injunction before the actual lawsuit, actual court action starts. Then this kind of specific explanation is necessary to ask the preliminary injunction. And actually, the clear deadline is uh, not. Uh, legally uh, uh, required, but uh, since the, the preliminary injunction um, should be used to make our first uh, uh, results, first decision, so maybe, and then the results of the preliminary injunction will be obtained less than one year, so as much as fast would be fine, but uh, maybe um, if you want to use the preliminary injunction, maybe the six months would be the first uh, target to file if you want to uh, enforce patent rights. Oh, it's just my uh, personal opinion, but uh, this is uh, might be some guide or answer to your question. I hope.